We were in the book of Romans on Sunday mornings or on our weekend services, and I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, you'll want to open to Romans chapter 2 as we look at this chapter in its entirety this morning for the purpose of seeing the big picture of what Paul's trying to accomplish. The title of our me- message is Dealing with the Self-Righteous Person. You see, chapter 1 Paul the Apostle dealt with the immoral person, the person that uh, we would say it in these terms in the United States of America, somebody that's just into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Man, that's what they're, they're just the party animals. That's what they're all about. And he gave a list of really uh, some pretty strong, graphic, immoral lifestyle and behavior. Uh, He goes from whether it's just... um, heterosexual sexual immorality to homosexuality and lesbianism and drunkenness and, uh, you know, the, the drug culture, all those things. There's nothing new under the sun. People lived back then like they live today when they don't want God in their life. And so chapter one kind of finished, and, and the self-righteous kind of smug moral person, the morally educated, looks at chapter one, and, and you might be in that place uh, that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, and you look at a person that lives a really immoral life, and you go, ooh, yuck, they deserve God's judgment. But you yourself think about your own moral rectitude or your a religious affiliation. We're going to look at two things, basically, those who are uh, educated by morals, whether it's from family or your culture, wherever you're at, and then those who bring, kind of drag their religiosity with them, but both who do not know Jesus as their Savior. Now, this is important to distinguish or you're going to get lost in this passage of Scripture. Also, it's important for you to understand so that you understand what Paul's trying to do, if you understand the whole book of Romans, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, is to convince the entire world that they've fallen short of God's glory, that they're sinners, and that their mouth would be stopped from excuses, and you finally go, oh, I'm a drowning man. I need a lifeguard. I need a Savior. And so that's the purpose of Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, and we're in chapter Two, so I'd like to say it's going to be light and perky when we get to chapter three, but it is not. So I'm just uh, want to have honesty in advertising what's going on for us, all right? But its point is really powerful. Now, to the immoral person, you usually do not have to convince them that they're a sinner or living wrong. I'll be sharing with someone, hey, you know you're a sinner and you need a savior? They're like, sinner, man, I should have a doctorate degree in sin. You know it. I'm, I'm a bad guy right? So you don't have to convince them. But those who are self-righteous, those who are moral in their rectitude, those who look at people that are icky, awful, bad, sinful people, they go, oh, they look down their nose and go, I'm so thankful I'm not like them. Those kind of people, when I share my testimony, because I'm a chapter one of Romans type of guy, Sex, drugs, rock and roll, that's what I grew up with. That's what I knew. That's what my family was about. Christmas Eve, our home was known as the party home. There was no nativity scenes out, let me tell you. It was a you know, big party thing. There were drugs and alcohol, and that's what we were known for. So I'm a, I'm a Romans one ch- type of guy, my background, that is. And sometimes I'm sharing my testimony with someone who's a Romans chapter two guy. And they'll look at me and they'll go, well, you needed to be saved. You were bad. And I'll look at him and say, yeah, but you need to be saved too. Why? I'm a good guy. I pay my taxes. I'm an American. The dollar bill says in God we trust. What do you, what do you mean? I, I must be a Christian. I live in America. I, it, heaven's going to be filled with people like me that are morally upright standing citizens. And hell's going to be filled with people like you because you're a bad guy. No, this is, the, this is a kind of a blow your mind kind of thought. Heaven is not filled with good people. Heaven is filled with saved people that become good because they're saved. Not just people that have a, a moral standard that they think. And this is the problem that um, people make that are uh, the self-righteous type. They're using the, lo- the wrong measuring stick for judgment. They compare themselves with other people around them. And so they can always make themselves look good. But that's not the measuring stick. The measuring stick is Jesus Christ, and he is perfection extraordinaire, and you fall short when you put your life next to his. So let's look at it. Let's read verses 1 through 11 as we see Paul dealing with Mr. and Mrs. Morality, people without Christ. 
Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you judge, you who judge, practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good uh, seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul who does evil, of the Jew first and also for the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also for the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. He says, first off, he said, you are inexcusable, old man, you who judge others, because in judging others and passing moral judgment, it is identifying that you do know there is a moral standard. And because you have this moral standard, you're constantly judging others, but you're living a hypocritical life. You yourself are doing the same things you're judging others. It's what Jesus said, that looking at someone who has a piece of sawdust in their eye, a little speck in their eye, and you have a two-by-four hanging out of your eye. Now, who says Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor? I mean, that, just the picture of it. I mean, people walking around with, got big boards hanging out of my eyes. You got a little, little bitty speck of sawdust, and I want to get that out. You see, judgmental people are that way. And they are morally rectitude in their own mindset, but they're usually very, very hypocritical. They judge others. That is a little Sunday school lesson if you're a judgmental person. When you're pointing your finger at someone in judgment, there are three of your fingers pointing back at you. So you are triple guilty as you <laughs> point at them and you have three fingers pointing back at yourself. Now, Jesus goes on to say in that incredible passage in Matthew chapter 7 that we are to judge for identification but not for condemnation. He goes on to say, you're not to give what is holy to the dogs. You're not to cast your pearls before swine. You will know them by their fruits. Uh, there are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. All of those things call for discernment or judgment. I, I, well, how do I know that's a that's a swine. How, how do I know that's a dog? How do I know that that's a wolf in sheep's clothing? How do I, will I know them by their fruits? Well, Jesus says it's for identification, but not for condemnation, meaning that I pass that final judgment. Only God can do that. Only God's the one that says, you know what? That person's going to hell. That person's going to heaven. Only God can make that call. I can't make that call. I can say that those who receive Christ are going to heaven. Those who don't are not. But I can't look at an individual and, and know whether they have received Christ or not, uh, especially if they're professing that they have. And, you know, is it genuine? Is it real? Uh, that's not my job. But I can judge by, for identification. I, do it as, I did it as a father, you know, uh, depending on what guys would come around to want to, you know, date your da daughter. Guys, you, dads, you make, some, you make some discerning calls right there if the guy pulls up in his pickup truck, and as he gets out, beer cans fall out, and he's got a Playboy in his back pocket, he better run in a zigzag pattern. <laughs> Especially if he showed up in a van, he's going to die. You know, I mean, it's just, just for identification, you know, not for condemnation. He might be a great kid to some parent somewhere, but he's not taking my daughter out. Anyway, so, uh, you know, you make those kind of calls. So, he says that God's judgment is according to truth. And truth, the, the definition of truth is reality, what is real and honest. And so truth is, is reality. God judges, he knows the real story of every one of your hearts, your minds, your thoughts, your actions, your deeds. He's gonna tell us that he judges everyone according to their deeds. He also says that judgment is accumulating those who reject the goodness, forbearance, and long suffering of God, the goodness that would lead us to repentance, are storing up or treasuring up 
for themselves wrath on the day of wrath. It's, it's the picture of a dam, if you will, that fills up with a trickle. It fills up with a raindrop. It fills up with the runoff of snow. But what happens over days and weeks and months, the dam begins to build up until it breaks. Meaning that if we don't get right with God and re- receive Christ as our Savior, that you're treasuring up judgment. Judgment is building Every decision, every thought, everything that is outside of God's will for the person that is lost. They don't, they don't know Christ. He's not their Savior. They're, his blood hasn't washed away their sins. So the self-righteous person thinks heaven's going to be filled with people like them. But that's not so. Heaven's going to be filled with people that get saved, are transformed, and then actually want to be good people because God has changed them from the inside out not because they're trying to be good people for God to accept them. It's the reverse of much what most of religion teaches. Most of religion says, try to work your way to God, be good, be good, be good, so that God will receive you. But no, Christianity is the opposite. Come to Christ by grace. It's a free gift, salvation. And then you become good as you hang out with God. Isn't that what happens? You see, this is the thing. People that reject the Lord and they're, They're ignoring his, as it says in verse 4, his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering because God wants to give you another day, another week, another month. People say, well, if God's in heaven and I'm living bad, how come God hasn't struck me dead? I've had people in my presence say, right now, God, if you're up there, strike me with lightning. And you take a long step away from them. (laughs) And I know that God's not going to do that, but I I have told the Lord before, if you're going to do it, this this guy would be a good one to practice on right (laughs) wipe him out. He'll be a testimony. Crisper critter is what happens when you shake your fist at heaven. (laughs) But God's not that way. Why does he give you another day, another week, another month, another year? Why does he give you 70 or 80 years? I tell people, you know what? You're breathing God's air. You're, You're only here a heartbeat at a time, one breath at a time by the grace of God. Because when he's done with you and he's given you that last day, that last moment, that last opportunity, you're done. That's what the Lord told Daniel to tell Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. He said, you have been found, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You're a lightweight man. You don't know God. You don't want to walk with God. And today, the very breath, your very breath is in the hand of God. Isn't it fascinating that God took the two most important life-preserving factors of your life and he took them out of your control? You do not control your heartbeat and you do not control your breathing. They're involuntary. So when he wants your breath to be done, when your heart's going to beat for the last time, it's in the hand of God. It's in the hand of God. And if you have ignored his goodness and his long suffering and weeks have turned, days have turned into weeks and weeks have turned into months and months have turned into years and you rejected God and your self-righteousness thinking that you're good enough to step into God's heaven without the blood of his son, the blood of the lamb washing you clean from your sins. You're seriously deceived because God's going to judge according to truth. And the reality is, you don't know his son. So he says people are treasuring up wrath, and it's going to be according to their deeds, according to their action, what they do. Now, he paints a picture. We're going to see basically Mr. and Mrs. morality in this without Christ. We're going to see Mr. and Mrs. religion without Christ. But we're also going to see Mr. and Mrs. Christian, saved people. It tells us in verse 7 and 10, it describes a Christian, eternal life to those who by patient continuing continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Then verse 10 and 11 But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. You see, God also is not partial whether you're Jew or Gentile. He's not partial if you're handsome or if you're ugly, if you're skinny or if you're fat, if you're rich or you're poor, you're educated or you're illiterate. God's not partial. God wants to know what you have done with the information about his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead. But the Christian who has received Christ, they want to be transformed. Now, this is a funny thing. Because I was Mr. Mr. Immorality of chapter 1, when I got saved, all my life changed. Didn't that happen to you? When I came to Christ, uh, it was funny. I, 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 I stopped wanting to get drunk. I, I stopped wanting to beat up people when I was drunk. I stopped 
uh, wanting to be violent. I stopped wanting to do drugs. I, I, I wanted to clean up my language. I wanted to actually be a blessing to people and do good to other people. And all of a sudden, because the Spirit of God came to live inside of me, it changed my heart. It changed my life. It did such a work in my experience of God that I was, I was a new person. And God gave me new desires. I started wanting to pray, and I wanted to read the Bible, and I wanted to go to church. And my friends, because I was 19, and all my friends, I would, they'd say, you're doing what on Sunday? I said, I'm going to church, man. You, what, who's making you? Nobody's making me. I want to go to church. I said, I've been reading the Bible, too. You, you're reading the Bible? What are you reading the Bible? It's really cool. Have you ever read the Bible? It's amazing what it says. It's really amazing. And I've been praying, and God's answering prayer that, you're going to church, nobody's making you. You're reading the Bible, nobody's making you. You're praying and you say God's answering prayer? Because I begin to change, it really freaked my friends out because they knew a whole different guy. So your life changes. What's it look like when even you have a sense of moral rectitude, but you're lost in your sins? This is the way it's described in verse eight and nine. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also for the Greek. Wow, so meaning that if I live a self-seeking life without Christ in my life, there is anguish, wrath, indignation, and judgment all coming my way. It's being accumulated, stored up, the wrath that is gonna come to my life. That's why the Bible says that the wrath of God was poured out on Christ at the cross so that you wouldn't have to experience that wrath. This is why it's so important for you to know Jesus personally. He goes on to say in verse 12 through 16, for as many as have sinned without the law will per also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these having not having the law, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. You see, God has all the information. He has all the information. People will ask, well, what if you don't, you've never heard about God? Well, then God will judge you based on your conscience, as this passage of Scripture says. Your conscience is a moral guide, though it's not a perfect guide. From the time that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a conscience was awakened in mankind. And there's a conscience. No matter where you go in the world, there are people with a moral code. And inside of them, when they do what's right, your conscience goes, boy, that was the right thing to do. And when you do something wrong, your conscience says, that was wrong, shouldn't do that again. Oof, that feels guilty, awful, don't do that again. Now, some of you have, uh, you honor uh, Mr. Jiminy Cricket, you know, from the Disney. He's on your shoulder. He's your conscience. He's talking to you. Uh, it, it's not that way, obviously, but it is right and wrong, and I have a conscience. So God says this, you know what? If you never heard about my word, you've never heard about Jesus, then I'm going to judge you based on your conscience because I have all the information about who you are. So the person in the jungles of Africa or the jungle of South America, they grew up in a tribe, they've never heard about God. How's God going to judge them? They've never heard the Bible. They've never heard John 3, 16. They don't know the Ten Commandments. They don't, they don't know uh, Sermon on the Mount. They don't know any of that. How's God going to judge them? Well, he's going to judge them based on what they know. See, God judges you based on the information you have. To whom much is given, much is required. Therefore, those who sit through this message, if you reject Christ, you are doomed. Why? Because you sure got a boatload of information. You can't walk away going, oh, no, now I know. You got to walk away and go, wow, now I know. Am I going to reject that or receive that? You see, it's based on the knowledge that you have. Isn't that great? So God judges based upon your knowledge. Therefore, we also conclude that as we look at doctrine and theological truths, that those who ultimately go to a place called hell, there must be varying degrees of judgment in hell. Everything's not dealt with the same. Jesus said this, this way in Luke chapter 12. He said, he, uh, he who knew his master's will 
and did not do it, he will be beaten with many blows. He had a lot of information. He sinned against the information. Therefore, his judgment was more severe. But he who did not know his master's will, and he did what was wrong, he will be beaten with few blows. Because his, he, his, he had less information, he didn't know. So his judgment is not the same. Now, Paul the Apostle is painting a picture that really confines you to taking a look at your life and going, man, what do I know about God? You know, what kind of information? If you grew up in the church, you grew up in Sunday school, your mom and dad know, uh, know the Lord, you grew up with Bible verses on the wall and them telling you Bible stories and coming to church for all these years, th the amount of information you have to be accountable to, the amount of light and illumination, spiritually speaking, that you have to be accountable to is enormous. But some of you, you have, I mean, today's your first day at church. You don't know anything about the Bible. That was my great fear when I started going to church, is I wanted to get out of church as fast as possible because I knew absolutely nothing about the Bible, and I was convinced that somebody had stopped me and asked me some Bible verse or asked me some question. I was just freaked out because I'm like, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. And that's the way I grew up. Now, having said that, he says, God's law is perfect. I mean, excuse me, God's judgment of those who have a lot of information or not very much information is perfect. Now when you talk to people why they haven't come to Christ, they'll make all kinds of excuses. It's smoke screens. It's deflection. You say, hey, have you received Christ? And they'll, they'll try to deflect it. And what about the people in Africa that haven't heard? Or uh, what about evolution? Or what about the... Di they, they have some kind of course or track that they choose to go on that is argumentative because they really don't want to answer the question. There are other people that say, I haven't received Christ, but, you know, God knows my heart. That's true. He does know your heart. Can you imagine on that day, people are going to stand before God. One day you, you, you are going to stand before God all by yourself. Your husband, your wife, they're not going to be there. Mom and dad, they're not going to be there. Your children, they're not going to be there. You are going to give an account to God in one of two places. The great white throne judgment, which is a place that unbelievers give an account, and or the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ where the Lord Jesus either gives you rewards or takes away rewards based upon your faithfulness with what he's given you in life, okay? If you're faithful with it or unfaithful, you gain reward or lose reward. But the great white throne judgment, that is a place that all of these books are, all of your sin, all of your attitude, it says, and the books, plural, were opened. Imagine a life that lives 70, 80 years without being cleansed by Jesus' blood all of the recorded sin of that 80 years of life, it's in the books. Every thought, every word, every deed, every action, everything. God has all the information. And when the Lord calls you into account for that, and you go, oh, that's not really how it happened. The Lord's like, really? You're going to draw that card? That's not how it I'm God. Michael, roll tape. <laughs> Can you imagine the HD screen in heaven? I, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to be blow your mind. So you pull the, oh, that wasn't how, that I didn't mean, I didn't hear, I didn't understand, I didn't get, I didn't. And it's like, roll tape. God has all the information. Well, right there I was thinking, the Lord goes, oh, okay, roll audio. Let's get what they're thinking. <laughs> he knows what you did. He knows what you're thinking. He knows everything. As a matter of fact, what's verse 16 say? It says, in, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. See, there's secrets. You got secrets. Those who don't know Christ. Now, I want to encourage you. If you know Jesus, I mean, just to think, just to think my life, the, the volumes or chapters my sin could have filled up just by age 19 is frightening. Like that bookshelf over there, that's all Rick's right there but I came to Christ, and now I'm in a different book. You're in a different book if you've received Christ. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the book you want to be in. That's the only book for me. I want to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're forgiven. So there's no recorded sin against your life, except your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus paid the price for all of your thoughts, deeds, and actions. But say you're not a Christian. You live 70, 80 years. You think you're a morally good person. You justify it by looking at others who are less moral than you. You use the wrong measuring stick, and then the Lord judges the secrets of your heart. You see, there's secrets in the lives of people 
that they've never told their husband or their wife. They've never told their mom or dad. They've never, never told anybody. Maybe somebody else was involved with that situation. They might know it. But the secret things that we've been able to hide or cover or have suppressed, think about that. And it tells us that the secrets of men are going to be judged by Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 5 that the Father judges no one, but he's given all the judgment to Jesus. Now, wouldn't Jesus be the perfect judge? Because he's the one that can look at you and say, why would you never receive me as your Savior? He's the one that died on the cross, shed his blood for you, was buried, rose from the dead. And, and you might be able to fool your friends, but you can't fool God. And here's Jesus. He's like, how come you never believed in me? How come you wanted to live in your sins? Okay, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And, and in that day, those who especially have a lot of information, they can never say that God sent them to hell. They heard the gospel. They heard the good news about Jesus, and they rejected it. How can they blame God with that wrong when they themselves wanted nothing to do with God? If you're sitting here today, you go, I don't want to receive Christ. I don't want to get right with God. I don't want to walk with God. Somehow I got snafu'd and coming to church today. I mean, they promised me lunch at Bubba's afterwards. And so here I am. You know what? You're going to be accountable for what you know. You're going to be accountable for what you know. Now, Paul says also something interesting in verse 16. He says, according to my gospel... Now, Paul doesn't have an exclusive ownership to the gospel. If you believe it, it's, I believe it, so it's my gospel. It's your gospel. It, taking ownership, I, I, my wife, is, she's my wife. She's not your wife. She's my wife, right? These are my children. United States of America is my country. This is my home. This is my truck. There's an ownership. And Paul the Apostle says, my gospel. Can you say that? Can you say it's my good news? That's what gospel means. It's my good news. It's my Jesus, does he know you? Do you know him? It, it, there, it's really important that you have that vital personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's my gospel. He's my savior. He's my Jesus because I received him into my heart and life. Now, having said that about kind of the, the, the uh, judgment of God, the evaluation of those things, then we see the religious person. We have to move because we're short on time. But verse 17 through 29, just follow along and let this wash over you, and I'll pick up a couple of thoughts, and we'll wrap it up today. It says in verse 17, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You there Therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who do not, uh, you say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written." For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Let me condense and distill down to a couple of points what Paul is saying. He now turns to the religious person. He said, you say you're a Jew. You're trusting spiritually in your heritage. You say you have the law, the word of God. And you say that you know the law so well, you can instruct others and help them in their life. But then he goes through and says, you also have ritual. You have the ritual of circumcision. But circumcision was meant for a spiritual lesson. It was a cutting away of the flesh, the life of the flesh, that you might live after God with a heart that's soft and tender spiritually. He's talking to a group of religious people that trust in their heritage, that trust in the law, that 
trust that they're a guide to the blind, that they trust in their ritual, but they're not saved. Can you be a religious person and not know Christ as your Savior? Almost certainly you can. Think of Paul the Apostle. He was out killing Christians. He was zealous as a Jew, killing Christians, going from town to town until the Lord Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and knocked him off his high horse and, the, and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And Saul asked a very good question. The very first answer, the question was, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. What do you want me to do? Well, go into town and I'll tell you what to do. So immediately, here was a religious, zealous guy that doesn't know God. You know, there are people that trust in their heritage. There might not, you might not be Jewish, but you come from a religious heritage. You might, in our area, you say, well, I'm Mormon or I'm LDS. But you can be Mormon or LDS and not know Christ as your Savior you might be as I was in my background. Now, I was a pretty immoral guy, and my parents didn't raise me in the ways of the Lord. But my grandparents on both sides were uh, saved people that were Baptists. So my heritage is all Baptist in nature. And so when somebody would press me about, and first of all, when somebody would try to press me about spiritual things, I would just dodge it because um, God and I had a deal. I'm running from God. He's chasing me. Let's not talk about it. That was, my, that was my thing. I know there's a God in heaven. I'm running from him. I'm living in a sinful lifestyle. Let's not talk about it. But when people would press me, like, what are you? And what's your background? And Richard, you know, I'm like, hey, let's not talk about it. Let's just whatever. And, but if they would corner me, I'd say, I'm Baptist. Was I saved? No. I was going to bust hell wide open. I wasn't saved. But if you ask me for my spiritual heritage, which goes back for many generations of saved people in the Baptist movement, that's my heritage. And I could have said, I'm Baptist. I'm good to go. Took care of it. But was it true? No, it wasn't true. I wasn't saved. There are some of you that when somebody asks you, hey, is Christ your Savior? Are you going to heaven because of the blood of the Lamb that was shed for you on that cross? You ask them that question. That's a pretty specific question. They go, yeah, I'm good to go. I'm Presbyterian. That didn't answer the question. Or they'll say something like this, ritual. I was baptized when I was a baby. I'm good to go. I had my christening. I had my confirmation. Well, confirmation is good if you've received Christ. I mean, you can receive Christ at a very young age. Is Christ your Savior? But what people do is they point to, they point to their heritage. They point to their ritual. They point to the things that are external, and yet their life is not any different. I have met people, I know you've met people that claim to be religious, and yet their lifestyle is so immoral, right? And what's he say about the hypocrite, the person that says they're spiritual or godly, and then they live a sinful lifestyle? It says in verse 24, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. There's nothing that gives ammo to the unsaved world like a hypocrite that says they are spiritual, and yet they are not a spiritual individual. Hypocrisy. So Paul goes through this whole thing, and he says, you know what? What, what good's your circumcision? I would say that to you. Hey, uh, some people trust in their baptism. Are you going to heaven? Well, I was baptized. Well, baptism doesn't save you. It proves you're saved. It doesn't save you. If you, if you got in water thinking the water saves you, you just took a bath and it was a big waste of time. Jesus, in a personal relationship with Jesus, saves you. And then you get baptized because you're identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. You're publicly confessing. And that's what the beautiful picture is. Just like the Jews in the Old Testament had the cutting away of the flesh that they might live after the Spirit, the Christian is buried with Christ in baptism, and the picture is that you're dead. Your old life of sin is dead, and when you come up out of the water, it's a picture of the resurrection and the newness of life in the Spirit. Do you have a relationship with Jesus that is internal and eternal, or do you have a heritage and religion without salvation. You can be involved with a lot of churches. You can go through a lot of religious mumbo jumbo. You can have a lot of ceremonies and still be as lost as the day is long. Isn't that something? 
That's something. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in that day, in Matthew chapter 7, he said, in that day, there will be many that come to me and say, oh, Lord, Lord, did we not? And he, they give a list of, you know, spiritual activity. And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You're a bunch of religious people that did not know me personally as your Savior. You didn't recognize the simplicity of your sin and the simplicity of my sacrifice to do a work of everlasting life. And that's what has to come together. I have put together, I'm this lost sinner, and I need a Savior, and I need to humble myself and repent and ask him to forgive me of my sins and turn from them and want to live for him for the rest of my life. You see, what Paul's doing is he's stripping away the smugness of the self-righteous and the smugness of the religious and what's standing naked and exposed is a man or a woman's need for a savior. And that's his point. That's what he does in chapter one, two, and three. He wants to strip all of this stuff away. So when somebody asks you this question, I want you to be able to answer it. Why are you going to heaven? You just simply need to say, because I believe in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose from the dead, and I've made him the Lord of my life. That's why I'm going to heaven. No heritage. Now, if my, my parents and my grandparents, if they're all saved, they had to get there the same way that I did. There's, you know, my grandparents couldn't repent for me. They wanted to. They prayed for me. They, they knew, boy, that grandson, he needs Jesus, right? Because I was lost and kind of tearing it up in the world. But I wonder here today, if it is true, think about it. This is the way God's judgment works. His judgment is according to truth. He knows the real story about every one of our lives. Those who reject him are treasuring up or storing up themselves, accumulating wrath that is going to come their way. He also is going to do it according to deeds, the things that you've actually done. He is going to judge without partiality. He knows the whole story, whether you have the law or the word or not the word, based on written word or conscience. And he's going to judge the secrets of your hearts. And I don't know about you, but I want to flee from that kind of judgment. I want to flee from that kind of judgment. I want to be safe in the arms of Jesus as my Savior because this is the bottom line. You are going to know Jesus as your Savior or you're going to know him as the judge. And I promise you, you want to know him as the Savior because otherwise you're going to know him as the judge of the universe. And he alone is worthy because he paid it all for you. And basically, Jesus would say, yeah, you can go to hell, but you have to go over my dead, crucified, buried, and resurrected body. I've done everything for you. Now, imagine you're here today, and you haven't received Christ. Fast forward 100 years. You're standing before the throne, great white throne judgment of God. You've never heard any information before now. This is your only time in church, your only exposure to the gospel. And you have enough information from this service to either experience everlasting life or eternal condemnation. It's your choice. Nobody can make that for you. Nobody can persuade you. Nobody can force you. This is a cool thing. You know, we're not holding a gun to anybody's head. You can walk out of here the same way you came in. But realize this. God in his love is chasing after you. If you turn in the slightest bit towards the Lord, he'll take a huge step towards you. If you turn and walk towards him, he will run to you. If you run to the Lord this morning, he will fly to you. He has no delight in the death of the wicked. He wants to see everybody saved. And he's knocking on the door of your heart today. And the lock is on the inside, and only you can open it. There's that same famous picture that's in the cover, a leaflet of many Bibles. Uh, the guy's name was Hanson that did this, you know, wonderful pic portrait of Jesus outside a door, and he's knocking on the door, and it's a rounded door, if you've ever seen it in a Bible or on a wall. And this man was a well-known artist, and he showed, obviously, artists have artist friends, and he showed everybody this picture. He's like, hey, look at my new painting, my, my new picture. And they begin to mock him. They're like, hey, you forgot the doorknob. I mean, who does that? Look, there's no doorknob. And he smiled, and he said, with a purpose. Jesus is knocking on this door with this door only has an inside doorknob. 
you can only open it from the inside. Jesus doesn't come and huff and puff and blow your door down like the big bad wolf. He said, this is what I've done for you. How are you going to respond to it? Heaven and hell. Eternity is on the line. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, Lord. You lay it out in such a way that it's really uh, either filled with grace and glory and excitement because we're a saved people by faith in you, or it's absolutely terrifying that we sit in an unsaved condition on our way towards judgment. Lord, I pray that your spirit would just move in the room right now and touch hearts and lives with the truth of your word. You tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that your word would have its effect on hearts, men and women here today. As we're just in an attitude of prayer, if you want to open your heart to the lordship of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that is offered to you, that you might escape that great judgment that ultimately will come on an unbelieving world and individuals. I just want to invite you to pray with me right now. Pray a simple prayer. Open your heart by faith. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for running from you. For my rebellious heart. For my immoral life. For my self-righteousness. I ask that your blood would wash me clean this morning. I receive you as my Savior. I believe you died for me, that you shed your blood for me, and that you rose from the dead. I receive your everlasting life. I ask that you'd fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit that I might have the strength to live for you all the days of my life. And I ask it in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen.